thing. They pull the first person, and let's say they get this 701, and then they go out and they pull the other competing spouse. Who maybe has had some credit issues. So when you look at this person, they have a 550, a 560, and a 564. They would use this 560. That's the middle number. All right. So what you have are two people applying. One has a credit score of 560. One has a credit score of 701. When the lender sees this, they will use guess which score? <laughs> they will use the lowest of the two because they want to make sure that if the bad person qualifies, then the good person should be fine. So they always use the lowest of the two middle scores for the combined partnership, whether it's marriage, whether it truly is a partnership or whatever. So if this is your husband and wife client that come in and these are their true middle scores, here is the one the lender is going to look at this 560. Now I'm going to tell you this and I want you to trust me right now because we haven't got to. At a credit score of 560, they will not qualify for virtually any loan that's too low you know 640 <clears throat> there are people that are going to tell you yeah we can do down to 500 but let me tell you now this person at a 560 probably would not qualify so the mortgage broker or the lender is going to tell this married couple sorry we cannot loan to you because you do not have the correct credit score so what happens is they go, oh, okay, well, let's not put this person on the loan. And therefore, now we're back to this credit score only because this person's no longer involved in the loan. Bingo. Now you have one person on the loan and the other person is not because they could not qualify or they, in essence, dragged it down. The downside to this is this. Because only this person is on the loan, only their income counts, right? We don't get the best of both worlds. Now... Whatever partner this is that's not on the loan, their income does not count towards the calculation that we're just getting ready to do here in a minute, okay? So if there's only one person, you get to use the benefit of the higher credit score, but the downside is you only get to use their income as well. So this is the very first thing a lender is going to look at. Is this person's credit score, which is based off of a FICO number, and that is supposed to give a person's historical um, acumen with business, okay? So the second thing they're going to look at is the current credit worthiness of a borrow. The credit, or the current version, the credit score was the historical, how they've handled the last two years. Now we're going to look at how are they currently making income and how is that income compared to what they want to buy? There is a math number we use that is called the debt to income ratio to determine how much debt a person currently is carrying. The slang for this is the DTI. They are going to check the person's DTI. <clears throat> so what they do is they look at the person's debts compared as a ratio 
to their income. Now, hold on. Don't panic. Because the word debt <clears throat> is another one of those words that lenders use differently than what you use. All right. So a debt to a lender is things that would potentially show up on your credit report, right? Car payments, student loan, uh, Visa cards, your Sears card, all of those things that show up. That's the debt we are talking about. What they do not count are things like your utility bills, your uh, going to the casino and having fun money, your grocery money. All of us consumers may say, well, I spend that. Yes, but it's not a debt to a lender. They're only looking at things that are, show up on the credit score. And they do this DTI on a monthly basis. All right. Because we pay mortgage payments by the month. So a lot of these calculations you will see done monthly. So let's do a quick example. Let's say a person makes $5,000 a month. That's a $60,000 salary, right? Five times 12. And they have $3,000 a month in car payments, in-house payments, student loans, all of that. This person has a 60% DTI, right? <clears throat> 3,000 divided by 5,000 is 60%. This is how much debt they have compared to their income. Their DTI is 60%. So what's good? Good question. Most lenders use this conventional terminology and they call it a 2836 loan. They want their clients to be inside of a 2836. So let's go through what this means. 28 is called the front end number. And it deals with only the housing bill. Only the housing bill. 28 means 28%. They only want a client to spend 28% of their income on their housing. So let's go back to the example that we talked about. Your client makes $5,000 a month times 28%. If I remember my math correctly, that means their principal and interest can only be $1,440 a month. That is the 28% of their income. So if a person says, well, yeah, I'm looking at like this $250,000 house and the payment on that is going to be $1,300, they have in essence cleared the front end, meaning that the house they're looking at is lower than 28% of that person's income. Once they clear the front end, they then have to clear what we call the back end number. And the back end number is, oops, all of the debts combined, they only want it to be 36%. But wait, here's a problem. All of the debts include the housing that we just calculated over here. I always go that way and it's supposed to be that way. So you need to subtract out the 28% you just calculated. And really, that only leaves a person 8% for all of the other debts. So you talk to this person and you realize they make $5,000 a month times 
is only $400 a month in other debt. So what you now see, knowing that the conventional lender loves this thing 2836, you can literally sit down with your client before you even go to show them a house and go, hey, dude, how much do you make? And they go, well, I make 5000 a month. All right. How much bills do you have? Well, we've got four student loans. I drive two Ferraris and my monthly bill and all that's 12,000 bucks. You go, wait, time out. You are not going to qualify because your back end number's way too high. No lender's going to loan you money. And what you just done was exactly what we talked about at the very beginning of this by taking that wannabe buyer and go, you're not a buyer. Maybe you should sell your two Ferraris. Maybe you should pay down your student loans and let's lower your monthly debt so that we can be inside of this range. All right. So this, most lenders are going to be a 2836 rule. Now, there are lenders out there that will do different configurations. So what you can literally do is now when you start partnering with a mortgage broker, you can literally ask him, hey, dude, do you have anything other than a 2836? And your mortgage broker, if they're good, remember a mortgage broker deals with many different lenders. And he is going to say, yeah, we have got the three lenders we work with. We got this really good lender that's 2836, and we can take all your strong clients to this lender. But we have another lender, and I'm making these numbers up, that is a 4055 lender. And you go, yeah, that would be great, because now let's do the math. 5,000 a year times the front end number, 40%, means they can have a house payment up to 2,000, which means what? A bigger house. And they've got 55% for the back end. But remember, you've got to subtract off the 40% you just calculated. So they make 5,000 a year times 15%, 15 is the difference between the 55 minus the 40. What is that? Uh, 25, $750 a month in bills. You may have a client that comes in and can fit this lender, but not the other one. Yay! Well, let me ask you a question. If your mortgage broker has this dude here that's allowing this kind of payments versus this dude here that's on, that's restrictive down to these kind, why wouldn't everybody in the world go to this guy? Hit pause and think about it. If you've got this guy that's more lenient, let's go to him. Well... I bet you didn't hit pause, did you? Because here's the issue. This guy might be at the current market rate of five and a half because this is, and I'm going to use this word and it's not necessarily true, a good borrower. All right. This guy, yeah, there's a lender out there that will do it but they are taking more risk and the translation of more risk means more reward. And that more reward comes in the form of a higher interest rate. This guy might be at seven and a half percent interest. He's going to be higher than the one over here because they are taking more risk, all right? So yes, your mortgage guy will say, oh, I can give him a loan 
and we got to go over here to Cardinal, not Chase. But Cardinal is the market plus two more percent. And that borrower is going to go, well, I don't want to pay that. Okay. So when someone says, I can't get a loan, I'll bet you they could get a loan. They just didn't like the terms of the loan. Because there's somebody out there that may do even higher, and it may be 10% interest rate, okay? So this is the whole concept of the debt-to-income ratio. This is what the lender is going to check for their current situation.